Uh, great. Uh, <coughs> a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I hope I'm suitably smart enough to continue. I'm glad of that. That's very kind of you. Um, can I congratulate uh, the Honourable Member for a very powerful uh, in, in speech on the, uh, this brilliant uh, 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 debate, and I think it's really important that he's laid many of the real issues that are before us and done so with great power and uh, an oratory, and I commend him for that. Uh, this is not a, an issue that in any way should divide us uh, who are here today, I hope, uh, but will unite us in the best traditions of, the, of this House. Uh, can I say that um, uh, the member for Wickham, my friend, my honourable friend, uh, asked if he could be recommended to this debate because he was unable to enter it, so I said I would do so, if you do not mind, Mr Gray. Uh, he is now registered. But anyway, that's by the by. He won't be coming to speak. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, but the key thing about this is that the, uh, the organisation IPAC, the Interparliamentary Alliance for China, uh, formed now of 17, uh, 18 countries, uh, uh, right the way from east to west around the world, uh, and uh, left and right in it, uh, helped sponsor Adrian Zenz, who came to us with his first report on the Uyghurs. It is this report which, again, has reignited, not to say that people weren't aware of it, but reignited this whole issue uh, with some of his findings uh, findings actually from official Chinese documents uh, that are actually related directly to individual officials. And I want to come back to that in response to the Honourable Member's uh, Magnitsky point because these are named individuals in the papers uh, by the Chinese government because they were party to this. Uh, and he made the point very clearly that there has been at least a million Uyghurs, nearly up to three million, have been detained in Xinjiang uh, in these re-education camps. And I won't go back into the details about these camps because the Honourable Member... Uh, has made it very clear. But these detainees have reported often being subject to uh, forced labour, political indoctrination and torture, uh, that almost 400 internment camps have now been built, uh, with dozens more still under development to be built. We've all seen the film that was shown to the uh, Chinese ambassador uh, on the Andrew Ma programme. Uh, he preferred not to recognise anything that was being said to him, but the reality is these are redolent of a time we thought that had gone, uh, of treatment of human beings that we would have ourselves looked back in history and thought we had finally banished, <coughs> but uh, it is not to be. And all of those points that the Honourable Gentleman has made about the treatment of the Uyghurs, uh, all of the torture, the forced sterilisation of Uyghur women now, which was exposed in those documents, which is a, a, a shocking tale, uh, and the preferment uh, of uh, non-ethnically Uyghur in the Uyghur territories. This is a terrible indictment. But I want to raise something else, because the long hand of those involved in this suppression reaches out way beyond China now. And I saw that um, something like 5,000 Uyghurs living in Australia, most of them former refugees and families, told a parliamentary inquiry of <coughs> frequent intimidation and harassment, WeChat calls from family members back in China, held in the presence of Chinese law enforcement people warning Uyghurs in Australia not to speak unfavorably of Chinese government, there's something happened to these family members. And one Uyghur received a message from a Chinese Ministry of Public Security after attending a Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square memorial warning that his actions would have an impact on his family. And the wife of the president of the Uyghur Association of Victoria, and I want to quote her here, says, I have left my homeland, but I continue to live in fear. If I speak out for my people inside my homeland, I'm afraid of retaliation on my family left behind. If I don't speak out, I feel guilty of keeping the freedom and democracy all just for myself in this <coughs> free country. Uh, Mr. Gray, this is shocking. <laughs> It is shocking because not only do we know beyond peradventure, we're on doubt, that what is going on in Xinjiang province to the Uyghur population, what is, in my view now, absolutely clear is a form of genocide, a deliberate attempt to eradicate a whole ethnic group. And by the way, this is not alone. Only a week ago, I held a debate on what was happening to the Tibetans, uh, and a similar thing is happening. And then during that debate... And the Honourable Gentleman rose to tell me that, of course, don't forget that in Mongolia, we are now beginning to see the beginnings of exactly the same process. So this is not a one-off. This is policy. This is policy that comes straight down from the Chinese Communist Party, the government, 
It is their view of suppressing any potential angry rows or debates or pressure. And it is appalling. And we know about all this stuff, and I mentioned the birth suppression uh, and the way that population growth rates have fallen uh, by 84% in the two largest Uyghur prefectures between 15 and 18 and declined further in 2019. Such activities <coughs> could meet that t uh, term genocide, but I believe that they do. And I wanted to come forward, therefore, on this issue that we all know. We accept religious freedoms, freedom of speech. These are normal here, but they are alien in a place uh, now like China. And if you add all of that together with the way they're behaving over Hong Kong, the arrest of peaceful protesters, uh, the movement of them back to China for a very unfair hearing, the likelihood of never being seen again, uh, their threats now towards Taiwan, their involvement in taking over the South China Seas against the UN's own statements about their uh, lack of any reality over this. They do not have any historic uh, presence in the South China Seas and then their clashes with uh, the Indian uh, army on the border of India. This we are beginning to see as a pattern of arrogant and determined behavior by a country that cares, uh, their government that is, that cares nothing about the reaction of the international community. So the question really is what can we do? And the Honorable Gentleman touched on the Magnitsky uh, amendments that we have made and that apply to officials. I believe, and I say to my Honorable Friend, he knows that I've said this before, I think there is enough evidence now from Xinjiang, from those official documents, now to move on many of those officials. Yes, I accept that these are not the, the top people, but these are at least a very strong signal. These will send uh, to the government that they're no longer going to tolerate, we are no longer going to tolerate it, and the rest of the free world is not going to do it either. And this gives us all that we need to start. There's also a new clause 68, <coughs> which is now being attached to the trade bill in the House of Lords, which I publicise here because it's important. I hope and believe it will return to the Commons, and I hope that we will all support that, because that makes it very clear that we cannot trade with countries that are guilty of genocide. And it will be our High Court that will make the decision about whether there is enough evidence. No longer do we have to worry about going to the UN to watch the Chinese block this uh, and their allies. <coughs> this will allow us independently. And under the Charter, we have a responsibility to act as a nation. Mr. Gray, I'm <coughs> going to put, uh, stop now, really, because I know others want to speak. But I simply say that there are a huge amount of areas that we can act, not just on Magnitsky. Uh, we can implement uh, sanctions. We can mount evidence suggesting violations specified uh, by the global human rights sanctions regulations that have taken place. We can uh, also ensure that we implement sanctions against those officials responsible also in other areas uh, like Tibet and even, as I say, growingly in Hong Kong itself. But we now need Mr. Gray to act in line with this petition. It has given us the very clear evidence that the British public have already formed their own opinion, and if we're not careful, we will be running behind them rather than leading them. Our purpose, I think and believe, is now to call this out and no longer to accept it. And as the Honourable Gentleman said, I have to say that no matter how much trade is worth to us, it is not worth that for the loss of those lives. Yeah.